We do record these. Um, and my name is James Davis. I run the Scale Up Business Training Program uh, with the Thurston Economic Development Council's Center for Business and Innovation. And uh, on this program, we bring in experts each month to talk about things that are specific to uh, specific concerns to business owners just like you. Uh, and we also have a number of different resources, um, including ways that you can um, work on your business plan, um, scale your business, uh, whether it be through the Scale Up Business Training Program or Business Enterprise Startup Training. Um, and we also have uh, a program called PTAC, which is one of the most uh, um, it's one of the best kept secrets, honestly. If you've ever thought about doing business or acquiring contracts through the government, um, PTAC is your place, and that is housed under the CBNI. Um, so, number of different programs. If you ever have any questions about any of the programs that we offer through the CBNI, feel free to reach out to, to myself. Um, also, Myra is on the line. Feel free to reach out to her. She is a, another business liaison through the, uh, the Thurston EDC, Center for Business and Innovation. Um, and with that being said, I want to introduce uh, Joe Miller. He's going to talk to us today about uh, five steps to a great elevator speech. And I am truly excited for this one. So take it away, Joe. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And just to uh, make sure that we're on board and everybody feels a little bit more comfortable. I think we've all been in a situation where we've been asked, so what do you do? And this could be at an informal networking group. It could be when we're on vacation. It could be by a stranger, somebody who we know lo loosely. And it too often happens where our first utterance back to the question, so what do you do, is uh, so if you've experienced that uh, moment when asked what you do, go ahead and raise your hand. Good. It's happened probably to most of us. And now that we've here, <laughs> John Moya, thank you. It, the interesting thing is that we've talked about it even a little bit. The next time it happens to you, even if you're prepared with the elevator speech that we talk about, you're going to find yourself when you say, uh, to start that, you're going to go, oh, I remember talking about this. So it's not uncommon. Don't shoot yourself over it. Don't get all worked up. Understand that there are tools that we're going to talk about today that actually get you out of that moment of, uh, because unfortunately, if you start that way, it communicates a couple of things. Either you're not excited about what you do or you're not good at it, or you really don't know what you do. So both of those aren't the communication we intend, but often that's the way it's interpreted. So we're going to talk about the five steps to telling people what you do in a way that they remember and they often want to know more about it. I really is, I'm really a big believer in a story type of format, and that's what we're going to build out here. Like we said, we're going to keep it really short. All right, we're going to keep the, the elevator speech really short. There is a workbook that goes along with this. You're welcome to download it either now or later. There are some preliminary foundational steps that I'll refer to in a moment, that the workbook will help you work through that. You're welcome to grab that workbook at pronetworkingleague.com slash elevator, or you can go to the main site, pronetworkingleague.com, and you'll see a workbooks tab there. You can click on there. So that's the things that are going to be available to you. Even if you don't get it right now, I think you'll find that working through that will be helpful later. What do you do? A big question that seems so daunting. A couple of foundational issues that I referred to that need to be answered in your mind and you need to be really succinct about. And this I would advise that you need to be succinct about even if you're not working on an elevator speech. Even when you have this speech dialed in, you know exactly how to say it, you're rehearsed, you're polished, people go, wow, you do that a good job. This still are foundational issues that we all need in our business. And the first one, we have to know that A, we solve problems and B, we need to know exactly what the most profitable for us problem that we solve. So you solve probably a few problems in your business, for your business, with your business. But which one's the most profitable one for you? Which one makes you the most money? Which one makes your business the most money? Think about that for a moment and actually identify it. Take a moment and identify exactly which one it is. 
it'll probably take more pondering that we're going to then we're going to allow for here. So even if you just have a notebook now, you just write down one of the problems you solve. That's fine. But you also want to identify your ideal client, the perfect client for that most profitable problem. Now, this doesn't have to be a client you currently have. Could be a client that you want to acquire. Could be a client that you aspire to meet. It could be any number of reasons, but you need to identify what that client is, what they look like. Are they people, obviously there'd be somebody who wants, or that can't afford your product or service. That would be a minimal standard. And you, and you probably want somebody that identifies and recognizes quickly what, they, what problems they need solved. But you get to list down in every business, every person in a business will identify their, their ideal client just a little bit different. But this is homework that's worth doing for many aspects of our life. And I talk a lot about professional networking and building networks. This is one of those things that if you can do, you can actually reach far into your network and be able to pull these ideal clients up from your network and your network will help you find them. So the first floor that we're going to go to on our elevator speech is when you're asked, what do you do? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to smile. Men, this is a generalization. We have a tendency when we're having a conversation to remain side by side. Now, I'm going to encourage you to take a moment and actually turn just a little bit so you're facing the person and you can actually make eye contact with them. I'm not talking about turning the full 90 degrees being or even 180 be face to face with them or anything, but you want to be able to make eye contact. And when you smile, you want that smile to say, I'm really glad you asked. I love what I do and I love talking about it. Please do not say the words, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, you're gonna blow the whole thing. So that's not what I want you to say, but it is what I want your, your smile, including your eyes to communicate. Remember, it's not a sales pitch. You're just excited to talk about the thing that you're excited to do. All right, floor two. Remember an elevator spit, Pete, pitch or elevator speech is is designed to only last just a couple of floors of transition. So it's pretty short. Now you're going to describe the problem you solve. We talked about one of those foundational issues. You're going to describe it. And this is how I suggest you start with the phrase, do you know how? And then you're going to describe the problem and specifically the problem that makes you the most money, your most profitable problem. And you're going to use as few words as possible. So who'd like to volunteer for a moment? Describe for me a problem that you solve in as few words as possible. Who can come off mute and go ahead and answer that? We find health benefits that work for you. Very good. Very good. And in this situation, we're going to define health we provide health benefits that work best for what's the ideal kind of client? Because not everybody is going to be available for you, right? You want, you're willing to sell to everybody, but there's some people that are perfect. So good. You're going to be perfect on the, the using as few words as possible. All right. And then you want to ask the question in such a way that you're, because remember you're in a physical world, you're not in a digital world at this point, and you're nodding you're smiling, you're using gestures, even subtle gestures that are getting engagement and agreement from the person you're talking to. They're coming along on this journey we call a story. They're coming with you. And so you're starting to invoke the physical world by nodding your head and you're getting agreement. Do you know how? Now, ideally you want this question to be based on something emotional, physical, and or philosophical. What do we mean by these? Emotional. I work with people who love to, or I work with people who, or the problem that they have is they, they want to get things that they feel that they deserve. If you're invoking feelings, they're emotional. All right, so you're going to identify the problem that help, that is emotional or physical. Physical might be so they can earn more money. Philosophical might be a term like the results they deserve. That's the philosophy. Their philosophy is they deserve more or deserve better. All right, floor three. Now you're going to solve the problem. You've stated the problem. Now you're going to solve the problem. That's what I do. 
I have to hesitate here. My old high school English teacher would really be frustrated right now because I just started with a question, do you know how? And now I'm, it seems like on paper, I'm answering that question. This is where tonality comes into play. You're gonna say, that's what I do, referring back to their question, what do you do? So work on that tonality. Think about it. you're saying it in such a way that throws it back. So, and don't get caught up with my grammar. All right, that's what I do. And then you're gonna briefly describe the results that you get for your ideal client. What results do they see from their perspective? So they can, so they are. So that's what I do. So those people can, and you move into that. Now we're back to the three components we talked about before. The results that your clients experience, if you can describe them emotionally, physically, and or philosophically, then they are ending up in a happy place. So you've described somebody who's having problems and then misery, their pain, and how the results that you provide take them to a happy place, to their vacation island, whatever it is. They're taken to a, a nice spot. And if, again, if you, when you evoke these three things, and ideally you could invoke all three, it's really difficult to do that. But if you can invoke all three of these components, then you really have the person coming with you. I'll step, or floor four. And this is where most people, when asked, what do you do? This is the floor they jump to. They just skip the first three floors and they come right to this floor. And they simply state their profession. I may, or their position. I am, let's take, for example, a real estate agent. What do you do? I'm a real estate agent. I'm really not taking the listener, the person who's asking the question on any kind of journey. There's no reason to remember them. There's no reason to think about how that impact, impacts them or the people they know. And perhaps worse, they have a preconceived idea of what a real estate agent is good or bad. Well, you're a different real estate agent than anybody else they know. So by you drawing out the previous section, the previous floors and taking those couple of seconds to define that and bring them into the story, they now see not just you different than all other real estate agents, but they also see real estate as a whole, and real estate agents as a whole, a little bit different. So now you've went from representing you and your company to also representing your industry. It's pretty powerful. Floor five, I have to tell you, this is the most difficult one. This is the one that people have the most problem with. And it's just really awkward and it's really difficult. So I'm just priming you right now. This is where a lot of you will go. Sounds easy, but then you'll recognize later you're probably going to struggle with it. So floor five is stop talking. Yep, just shut up. Zip it. There is going to be a screaming silence. Endure it. Be quiet. Let them speak first. You have an advantage here. You know there's going to be an awkwardness of this silence right now. You know it. So you should be able to outweigh them. In sales, if you ask for a close, if you go to close somebody and ask them to sign the documents, you know that the best thing you do is ask them to sign the documents and then be quiet. Now we're not in a sales pitch here, we're in an elevator pitch, but this is going to encourage them or get them to react to you in some way. They're going to come back to you with something that they can do that move and tells you something about the establishment of that relationship that you've now established, or even to some degree, the effectiveness of your elevator speech. You have an outsider giving you an evaluation and they don't even know it yet. All right, before I go any further, are there any questions about any of the first five floors? And there's only five floors. No questions? It's pretty clear? Okay. Yep. Somebody had, Daniel, did you say something or? Uh, it's, it's clear. Okay, good. So let's talk about the potential results that are going to happen. I break these into three categories, three different areas that can happen. The first one, it's a no. Person's not interested. They have no association with you. They don't do anything that pertains to that. They don't understand. They're not interested. We think of this as a negative thing, but actually it's a pretty positive thing. It can be. 
if you understand that what they've done is just culled themselves out of your net, they've moved themselves away. And if you've been in sales or try to do business with people who you're kind of trying to coax into doing business, you know that you'd rather have those people just step away from your net almost right away. So this is one of the effective ways. And this looks like a couple of different things. It, it could take the shape of, oh, okay. And that's kind of the end of the conversation. It could take the shape of, all right. And then they start to give you their elevator speech. It kind of tells you that they asked you, so they had a window to tell you. So it, it's not negative. You understand more about them at this point, and that's a good thing. The, the second option is that they'll find a way to relate to you. They'll find something that puts them in your world. I have a niece that does that. Oh, my grandfather used to do that kind of thing. Oh, do you work with, do you have associations with this kind of field? They'll figure out some way to grow and create an attachment with you. I would say 80%, maybe more of the people you give a good elevator speech to will fall into this category. They'll find a way to relate to you. They are, they have now, you've now seized the opportunity to actually expand your network. If you want to, you can take that. And if you loosely know them, let's say in an informal networking group, somebody asks you, somebody you might know the name you've never really associated with, you can take that opportunity to actually, and this has tightened the, the small string that has them in your net. So you're actually strengthening those, those bindings or somebody that's a complete stranger, you can now include them in. And you can continue the conversation really any direction you want to from there. They don't feel threatened. You don't feel let down and you've created a professional relationship that could be really beneficial to you. The third option that could happen is they want to do business. They kind of like step back and go, oh my gosh, I have been looking for this for I don't know how long we need to talk. The likelihood of this happening is about 1% maybe. So I don't tell you this to be discouraged when it doesn't, but you need to be prepared somewhere that this could happen. And you have some choices here. You can pull out a business card and go to work and go sit down and write up a contract if that's what you want to do. If you're on vacation, you might want to talk to your significant other before doing that, but that's up to you. The, the other option is exchange information. You make contact with them as soon as you can. So all those things play into the idea that they want to do business now and you really don't want this opportunity to, to go away. That is the potential of a significant elevator speech. It is a potential for you. So what does your elevator speech look like? Is anybody taking notes and want to address some of these and how you would do it? I can give you an example of how mine are, but we can review what the floors are. Okay. So who knows what the first floor is? Okay, Victoria, go ahead and say it. Smile. Smile, that's exactly right. What's the second floor? Describe yep. the problem you solve. Exactly right. Good job, Ashley. You describe the problem you solve. Exactly. And who knows the third floor? Solve, solve the problem. problem solve the problem that's exactly right and the fourth one fourth floor state your profession exactly state it what it is that you do and the most treacherous and dangerous floor to get to and actually hang out on is the fifth floor what is that yeah. Yeah, exactly right don't say anything more keep it quiet you can stop explaining so let's use some examples. Let's take, Susan, you talked about electrical bikes and what you do, right? Which is find really fascinating. Personally, I find really fascinating. So I'm a complete stranger. We haven't been hanging out for 20 minutes. So we, we just got to know each other. We're on vacation, all right? And I say, what do you do? Well, I, um... Wait, give me a second to gather. That's all right. Lots That's why we're here. You have to okay. digest. So good. You started with a smile. Good job. Right. I got number one. I you got did well. Good job. Okay. Um, 
I build custom high-end electric bikes for individuals looking for electric bikes that don't necessarily look like a bicycle. Okay, I like that. So if we were to change that just a little, I like what you said, if we were to change it just a little bit where it, it was, do you know how people are looking for an electric bike that doesn't look like an electric bike? Right, does that okay. make sense? Because Yeah, now I know, it, it does, it does. You've, you've now asked a question where they're gonna engage and go, yeah, or do they? But you've asked it in such a way that's like, okay, I can identify that, I, I'm here, I'm with you. And then you turn into, well, that's what I do. We manufacture electric bikes that don't look like electric bikes and people love them. So you wanna try it again? I'm putting you on the spot, I know, but I'm gonna put other people <laughs> on the spot too. Um, sure, sure. So Susan, what do you do? Have you ever seen an electric bike that doesn't look like an electric bicycle? Well, we build electric bicycles that look more like a motorcycle rather than a typical electric bicycle. And I happen to be the founder of that company. Perfect, good job. And you were quiet after you stated it. That was really good. That was really, really good, very good. So am I gonna volunteer somebody else or am I gonna get a volunteer? I'll volunteer because I need help. Okay, go ahead, Daniel. So Daniel, yes. what do you do? Have you ever driven through rural Washington <clears throat> and wondered what's going on? So I provide an economic revitalization and sustainability infrastructure platform for rural Washington. Very good. So when you ask the question, what do you or do you know how you've driven through central Washington and wonder what's going on? Right. Can we t tweak that just a little bit where it comes out as a problem? Because for me, the, I wander around looking at things, wonder what's going on all the time. That's just me. Yeah. So the, the problems that from from our perspective or from my perspective, we have the, the digital chasm, so there's the lack of connectivity, which affects commerce, public safety, communications, education. Then there's also what I call cultural and geo-Darwinism, which affects the communications between rural and urban Washington. Okay, very good. I'm glad you didn't use that terminology in your elevator speech, so good job. I know what most of what you said means because I hang out with people like James. Yeah. And he uses big words too. So where's the problem that the public sees or the decision makers see? The, the problem is there's a, an economic decline in rural Washington, as well as the rest of the country. There's 46 million people that are rural that don't have digital connectivity. And those communities are in utter decline. Okay, so perhaps part of the problem that you're helping to solve, this is really powerful stuff, what you're doing. The, now I'm distracted on what you do. <laughs> Good job. The, so the problem is a lot of our rural communities don't have the access to enjoy the success of the rest of the world, to enjoy the, what is to, it that they don't get? To, to some degree, but they they don't while they don't are not able to enjoy the access they when they don't have the access and once they do they have then access to powerful tools but they can't optimize those okay. because they don't know how to use them therefore we lead into the uh, uh the digital literacy platform okay so and i'm going to dig here a little bit on you sure. so thanks for volunteering the idea of the person that you enjoy helping the most is the person getting the connectivity or the person who is starting to use the connectivity? Because those are two different people, right? So which one do you prefer to work with? It's all. So the, the, the infrastructure involves six different modules, which combines the in, entire network of individual counties and then connects those counties with each other. Right, and that's a lot of the how. So again, I'm gonna come back to, Okay. you get to decide which of these people you're solving a problem for, which one gives you the biggest joys. Like, 
I love seeing people who discover the new technology they have and learn how to use it. That's what I do. I help people who are new to the internet be able to harvest all the benefits from the internet or however you want to do it. Yeah, no, it, the, the, that's for the most part, that's correct because the, the, the tools and technologies that we provide um, are, are for the people that did not have access, did not know how to use them. So now they can be more productive, um, you know, help, help right. families, et cetera. Right, and move them out of poverty. That's really good. So what is your profession? Uh, outside of this? No, this. for this for this job, for, what is your, your for, statement? For this, I, I'm, I'm the CEO and founder of the nonprofit called Convergence. Okay. And, and the purpose is future-proofing prosperity for rural America. Good. So you're the CEO slash founder right. of what is it? Convergence. Convergence. Right. That's it. That's floor four. I am the CEO or founder of Convergence. Right. Okay. And then what's floor five? What do you get to do? Perfect. You just did it. Good job. <laughs> that was really good. All right. Good job. Appreciate you playing with me, Daniel. It, what you do is really amazing. And it's really, I think those of us who enjoy the benefits of technology don't understand that you're providing this same gift that we take for granted to people who yearn to have it. So well, I, I would, I would like to talk to you after this, if we can, because of the people that are involved, you know, the, the senators, the congressmen, the governor, and, and then the fortune 500 folks. Absolutely. That's, Not that's a problem. why I'm taking this class. Okay. And here, I thought it was all about me. Come on. <laughs> Now, I'll stick around afterwards when we're done here, when we're officially completed, I'll stay on as an answer or entertain as many questions as there are. I have no problem with that. But thank you for playing with me, Daniel. And I appreciate your patience with me. Good job. I am impressed with what you do. Okay, another volunteer. Is it Tamara? You're on mute. Thank you. Yeah. Can you see me at all? I can see you. Is it oh, Tamara okay. or Tamara? Tamara. Thank you. So yeah. Tamara, what do you do? <laughs> um, so I don't have a, I don't necessarily solve a problem. So I guess that's why I'm wondering what I would say. Um, so let's talk about what you do. Yeah. So we um, we sell um, artwork. Okay. Um, so I guess I would think. Um, what kind of art do you sell? It's um, laser carved three D wood maps. Wow. That's so good. where are you? Um, physically. We're in Bothell. Okay. Very good. That's impressive stuff. So you do carvings, laser, I assume. Yeah. Okay, and. It's on wood, if I remember, is the substrate? It is, okay. yeah. It's pretty cool. So, I mean, part of it is, you know, people, um, our market is, a lot of our market is boaters or people that live on the waterfront or people that maybe have fond memories of, you know, um, somewhere with water around it because it's the water that's carved in 3D. Right. So, um, you know, maybe like, do you know how maybe you're looking for uh, a souvenir or, a souvenir or a um, a gift that is personal, but you want it to be very stylish, or you know, you want it to be not a trinket, you know, something. Right. I don't know. Right. I'm not sure what the problem is. I mean, but really, okay. it's it's yeah. This it is good. I appreciate you volunteering people. because it's these kind of awkward things I find fun. So thank you for volunteering and let me play. This is fun. I would suggest yeah. if your best paying clients are boaters or those are the ones you like to play with then stay with that okay yeah Maybe boaters be... or people that live like on the water a lot of mm -hmm. times like waterfront homes okay pick one okay right? so you're not confusing yourself and it doesn't matter which one you pick so pick one okay um i say people that live on or near the water okay so if we start with, do you know how people that live on or near the water, what's the problem? What are they looking for? What is it that you're 
issues solved. They want art that represents the beautiful Northwest. They want, what is it? Yeah, I think a lot of times they're looking for a way to decorate their home that also is personal and has meaning. Perfect. I like that. So you know how people who live on the water up in the Puget Sound area or in the Northwest, you get to define that. And they're looking for decorations in their home that are unique and depict for them the emotions and the beauty of the Northwest. Are we there? Are we getting close? Yeah, maybe you can get my elevator seats for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now we've drawn the problem, right? There are people who live in the Northwest that are looking for art. Okay. They live on or near the water, which probably at, at some level has spoken to the economic level, right? Whether we want to think that way or not, that's the reality of it. So that's right. a really, really good foundation for the problem you solve. The problem is they're looking for art. You defined who the client is and the problem they have. And for people who live on or near the water who are looking for art for their home and now you talk about in the emotional sense what that art depicts for them represents the beauty of the northwest or what however you want to do that okay so remember the three bullets we talked about you get to harness those and then you go to that's what i do i create and you describe the art succinctly so go ahead and say that that's what i do the whole thing Yep. Well, just start at the, oh. that's what I do. That's what, I, oh. okay. That's what I do. I um, create um, art and that, that they can enjoy. Good. That's good. That's, and it can be that simple. That's um, not good. <laughs> no, it's not great, but it is good. Uh, how, how about if we take that just up a notch, bring some more emotion to it. I, we create art that people just love. Okay, so okay. bring that so we create, we create, Yeah, we create art that people love and cherish and can hand down from generation to generation. Perfect. Now you've actually described an heirloom. Beautiful. Perfect. Keep it. All right. Okay. And then what's floor four? Um, I just did that, right? That's what I do. That was floor five. You're an overachiever. You got ahead of me. Floor four is state what state. state your profession i'm the owner i do this i'm an artist okay um uh, i created that my husband and i created this company okay so what is the name of the company uh bella maps bella maps so i'm the owner of bella maps or i'm an owner of bella maps it can be okay. that simple for floor four okay again okay. this is where most people just jump to so the extra work in floors two and three is it's challenging. It's challenging to work through this and it takes some reps to go through it. So be patient with yourself. What you've done in the last few minutes is pretty remarkable. It really is. I've thrown a lot at you. You've digested it well and you've done a really good job. So play with it. You'll find other words that feel good. And honestly, the elevator speech, speech that you give should sound and feel different than the one your husband gives because your perspectives are different. Your professions that you state maybe i guess same. part of part of i think that it's like it's hard to like just pick that one group because it's like i kind of want to say you know there's boaters people live on the water or people that are looking for a thoughtful gift but you don't i shouldn't say like all those things just no i wouldn't it, it clouds the story so okay. and let's think i don't want to get into motion pictures and things like that but most of them have a character and everything subordinate but the story is about a character making a transformation so that's what you're doing here you're choosing a character you're just defining the character okay, okay? and you're staying with that character it, we think especially as small business owners we often think if we narrow it down we're excluding everybody else yeah and that's not the case actually the opposite is true well would that work for me i love going to the water but i don't live on the water Oh, yeah, I guess you could twist my arm to sell you something too. <laughs> okay, so it, people will buy into the story. We have this FOMO fear of missing out, fear of being left out. And so when we tell right. the story, we want to be a part of the story. We want to find a way to identify. So we're going to ask, we go to one of the potential results. Well, would that work for me also? I don't live on the water, but I love the water. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Now yeah, you've moved you. in, into one of the results that you really love. <laughs> okay, so good job. And rehearse it, play with it. Any of you, I know we're kind of short on time, James, sorry, but the if you want to come up with one, I'll leave my email address. You can send me a video. I'm okay with that. Any of you can send me a video with your elevator speech. You can type it up and send it to me. I'll give you my feedback and you implement it the way you want to. All right. So real quick, if you can remember what floor four is, go ahead and say it to yourself. Okay. What's number one? What's floor one? What's floor five? You remember? Floor three? Floor two? Good. Good job. I really believe that a great elevator speech is a critical component to your professional networking. It helps you expand it. Those of you who are in formal networking groups, whether it's BNI, a chamber group, or any other group, you likely have an opportunity to give commercials or something they call that's like a commercial. You can actually take your elevator speech and plug it in. You'll find the time's about the same. And that gives you a chance to regularly rehearse and refine that elevator speech. So I'd include, encourage you to use that. So again, I'm Joe Miller. I'm with the Pro Networking League. You can find us online at our website or you can go to social media and find us. I will stay on after James is done as long as he'll have me on. I'll entertain any questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll ask James because he knows the answers to all things he told me. James? Joe. Well, hey, Joel, I bet I put you on the spot. What is your elevator speech? Very good. Appreciate that. You're going to ask me the question? Hey, Joe, what do you do? You know how people know that word of mouth advertising is the strongest and best form of marketing? Well, that's what I do. I help business professionals design, grow, and strengthen their network so that they can get the benefits from it and cultivate the business that they want. I'm the commissioner of the Pro Met, oh, excuse me, I'm the commissioner of the Pro Networking League. No, it's all just wait in silence. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Joe. I, I appreciate that, man. I, I really appreciate having you on. Um, I, I think you are perfect on time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and leave it open for questions. Um, if there are some questions, if anybody wants to uh, um, refine their elevator speech right now, let's let's go ahead and leave it open for a few minutes. Hey, I, I'll take whatever input I can get. This is the potential to, to be huge. It affects really everybody in rural Washington. Yes, what you do does. Right, and you know, in the, in the of the and even bringing people and businesses in. So, if if I'm not, I don't want to interrupt or monopolize the time, but I can tell you what the eight mod of the six modules are and then if you want to ask questions or give me advice or support or something i would love to hear it okay and before we go in that direction sure let me ask real quick that do is yours a, a public sector or is it a private sector company it's a 501c3 it's both okay. a washington state nonprofit that kim wyman helped me set up Okay. And then Kathy McMorris Rogers helped push it through quickly to become a 501c3. Okay. Who do you rely on for funding? That's one of the things right now. So I'm just, I'm trying to, uh, I, my, my wife and I have put a couple hundred thousand of our own money into it. And I want the county in which I live to uh, have a little skin in the game. So yeah. I, I want I, them to pay for the website and, yeah. then, and I can go out it from there. So you're in the right place. If you're hooked into the EDC and the scale up program, right. you're you're in the right place. That's for sure. Okay. The have you been to a local PTAC office? I have not. Okay. Go there. They will help you set up NAICS codes. They'll ha help you set up um, grant writing. They'll help you set up all sorts of things that go beyond your county. A really phenomenal resource that too many small businesses don't take advantage of. So and James you, can probably speak more to that than I can. 
Oh, I was just going to ask Daniel if you've already uh, reached out to the uh, the Penderill uh, EDC or the um, the chamber down there if um, if you're working directly with uh, with either one of them. Yeah, I, I I know them all. I've worked with them the last couple of years, and uh, uh, great folks. A lot of them don't get what I'm doing. They they uh, they see like the individual components, like, okay, you, you, you run the broadband action team. I see, I see what that is. And we see the people that are involved and, and, and we, we kind of understand your digital literacy program, but it doesn't mean that I want to go out and learn the hyper-converged infrastructures or to be a data scientist that, that, so it's those kind of things. And they don't understand how that would lead to an ag food supply chain network. So uh, I, I know them, I work with them on a regular basis. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, I've, uh, I, through the scale-up program, I, I work with them as well, um, in a different capacity, obviously. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it is definitely something, as I talk to these ADOs out there, um, they are very keen, they're very aware that they need to increase their broadband um, and their infrastructure uh, uh, building in order to expand. But it is one of those things where sometimes they don't know what questions they don't, they don't, they don't, sometimes they don't have the answer, their questions or the answers that they need to know. Right. Now, I think one of the things that you're probably going to run into is people who need to make decisions or need to understand it don't understand everything that you do, the right. hows, the nuts and bolts, but they don't need to. They need to know where things are and where things need to be, how you get them there. So if I were to sell you the idea of I'll take you to Maui tomorrow, you'd probably be, well, hopefully you'd be excited to go to Maui, right? Especially during the rainy season here. I wouldn't, but. Okay. Somebody would. A lot of people would. The idea is that I'd want to get you excited about the destination. So I pick a different destination. I want to get you excited about the destination. I'm not going to tell you about having to deal with the TSA and perhaps you're going to right. lose your bag and all, all those nuts and bolts. Right. That's, that's, that's your specialty. Right. And so if, again, if I'm selling you a vacation, I need to sell you the vacation, the sunshine or whatever it is that you want that, the thing that they want to hear and stay out of the nuts and bolts. Right. And, and, and they, I was encouraged to run for a commissioner. And when I, I gave my pitch and I talked about economic data and jobs and apps that I re-engineered and, you know, uh, all, all the, the, the algorithms that I wrote and saw the deer in the headlights, I realized that I needed to kind of pivot and, and bring it to them in such a way that wasn't technical, right? Which, which I've now done, but part of it is the enormity to them is such that they're, they 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 kind of are taken aback, and and that was my job before I came here. I mean, this, right. this is a little compared to what I used to do. So simplify what you do, right? So it's right. nuggets that they can remember. Right. And what you want to do is you want to be able to tell them in ways that are sticky, mentally right. sticky, so they can retell the story 90% correct. Right. As soon as you start talking about putting nuts and bolts together, even right. their digital nuts and bolts, I'm not going to remember. Right. You tell me about a kid who went from barely being able to get through and learning how to read and, and being felt behind mm -hmm. to being able to go to college. That's a picture. That's a story I can come along with. Right. So yeah, really, and that's true with all of our network, all of our professional networking, anything we do, it needs to be done in such a way that people remember almost without thought, without intentionally trying to remember. They remember because stories play such, I'm a real big believer on tell things as a story that hits them in their mind and in their heart. And they will carry it with them. They, know, they may not even remember where they got the information, but they'll remember the story. And that will sail your ship. Very true. I've had so many of those, Daniel, where I've created a process or something in the background. You try to tell somebody what you've done and they're just deer in the headlights and like, no, really, it just makes everybody's job easier. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, it, and we've done that 
uh, with a few folks, you know, in rural, I'm, I'm up in the Northeast corner of Washington state, well, we're all in Washington, but in Ponderay County and uh, worked with a couple of contractors and trained them a little bit on finances and on some apps that would make their job easier, more profitable, and they've done really well. So I told that story because it's, it's not like I said, it's not like we're, we're going out and want you to get some STEM degree. We just want to help you be more, more profitable, provide better for your family, for yourself, the community, you know, right. and it's, and it's all interconnected. The interoperability of everything here is like the, the tree from Avatar. Hmm. Yeah. So what you do, I think is really important. I'm impressed with what you do. You could probably talk about the ins and outs of the, um, the intricate pieces. What I refer to as the curse of knowledge. You have far more knowledge. You could talk to it about with my two sons and they'd be right on board. They'd be going to town with you and you're going to have a heyday and I'll. Well, the, the and part, and, and I agree. Part of the problem I have is when I talk to folks like in Seattle or Olympia, or, or even Spokane, they they get it. They, this is awesome. When I talk to the rural folks, they they typically don't. What are they afraid of? Um, rural folks. I, I I I don't know. I'm new here. I mean, okay. I I I grew up in Chicago. I lived in New York. I, after grad school, I bounced around the country from because of my job and ran global platforms for huge companies, mm -hmm. and so. I'm still kind of the new kid here. I've only been here a few years, um, so I don't I don't know if it's change. Maybe they're afraid of change and the or the unknown, or they don't want to be called out because they're in most people's minds uh, they're not doing the job that they were elected to do mm. and, because they don't know. Right. Right. And they're intimidated by you when you talk on those levels and you're explaining things and you. You get into what I call that curse of knowledge because of all your knowledge and you get excited about it. You're, I and mean, this is real to you. It's not anything extreme for you. It's your normal life. They can become fearful and they just uh, lack that. It, 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 and I thought about that. So it's, uh, when I, when I give my pitches, sometimes I'm a firefighter, you know, so I go in and I've got my, my, my firefighter stuff on and I don't shave and, you know, <laughs> got my hat on and backwards or whatnot, <laughs> you know, so, so I, I, I do fit in. You know, people don't know that I, I came from Chicago and New York um, most of the time. And so, you know, I've been embraced by a lot of the people in, in the county and somewhat informally appointed to lead this because nobody was taking it on. That's, and that's part of the issue. Well, it sounds like part of it also is if you're fairly new at doing this, there's a certain time ramp. You just have to allow that compounding effect of knowledge and knowledge growth to right. allow that to happen. Yeah. And you're there waiting for it. You just have to wait for people to catch up to you. Yeah. And, and it's, it's what I would call the epitome of cultural immersion, mm -hmm. which part of it is if I use that term, like, you know, the cultural Darwinism or geo Darwinism that if you've not lived or spent a good deal of time in any environment, you typically don't get it. Right. I grew up on the South side of Chicago. I, I get it. Right. Yeah. Um, I lived in Manhattan on Broadway. I get that. I lived in Chicago and not only the crappy part, but I lived in a condo on Lakeshore drive. I, I get a lot of those environments and now I live rurally on a ranch nice. with, with not a stoplight in the County and no noise <laughs> wild animals you know um i i i understand i'm friends with the, with the firefighters and the cops and the people that run the area as well as in the next couple counties over so I'm, hey, daniel I'm, i, I want to give uh, nikki a chance to ask her question she's still on here um oh, really appreciate the uh the feedback that we are you know the the conversation though i think people learn from the conversations of other people you know other uh business owners and people that have those those same questions um so oh, i please, appreciate please. that I'm sorry, i didn't mean to monopolize oh no, no 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 you're fine absolutely um so i just want to go ahead and uh, open it up to nikki nikki you're still on the line right nikki lynn 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought I unmuted. Um, I was learning a lot from that discussion. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Um, I own what's called Urban Sanctuary. And my problem is um, just making this place a more peaceful world. <laughs> it's kind of broad. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm trying to find the ways. It's a fourfold mission. Um, it's a very small space, only 800 square feet. Um, so it's like a yoga studio tonight in about an hour. <laughs> and then it's, um, it's a, a prayer and meditation spot with a 22 foot labyrinth. Um, when I take everything and move it out of the way and open out the labyrinth. And then it's um, a creative expression space where people can come just lose themselves in a creative activity um, and, and much more. But it's like, how do you convey it succinctly when it's so multifaceted? Well, and in regards to an elevator speech or in networking in general, you have two choices. One, you can go, what we talked about in the previous presentation, you can go find, figure out which one's the most profitable one for you, right? The other option is find out what the common thread between all four of those are. What is- spirit, Spiritual development and growth. There you go, bam. And that that's what fun. you hone in on and that's what you stay on and that's what you communicate, but you communicate into a way that people who are not part of that world, who don't use the same language. So I've been, exp I've been experimenting with that, that avenue. And uh, with the exception of making a question, I find that fascinating to engage them. So um, I, I guess I, when I've asked questions, it seems prying and I don't know where, when it's into your spiritual life, it's a very touchy area, you Indeed. know? Indeed. So I, go ahead. So I think one of the things you could do, and this is, um, it's kind of an elevated level, not what we we're coming in here. So you're getting a behind the scenes look a little bit. Well, survey, yeah. survey your clients. And with well, the simple I question, have, of, I don't have a whole lot yet. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Just survey the ones you have. It doesn't matter if there's only two of them. Survey them, make it a somewhat formal survey so they feel like they're really engaged and they'll commit to it. Not just a conversation where they need, they might feel they need a safe face, but ask them, what do you like about this? What do you like about the program you're in? What, um, what do you, um, what brought, brings you, well, it's not what brought you here, but what continue, what helps you continue to be, be here? Um, what could change to make it where you're even more comfortable here? So those kind well, of things really feed to that, and then you'll find a thread in there. But what I'm finding is that people just need to come in and see it and go, once they step inside, they feel it. It's it's very um, spiritually energized. It's like they you just hear this exhalation, mm. and so it's it's like, have you ever felt stressed? Have you <laughs> have yeah. you ever felt like your world's out of control? Have you ever felt like you don't have, you know, yeah, a depression? You, yeah. All those things. Yeah. So just so, trying to get it into into those questions that are not too prying, but are like you say, leading and engaging. Yeah. So how about this is a suggestion you can think on that you, you know how some people just so feel so overwhelmingly stressed or you know some people have they're so stressed they don't even know how stressed they are exactly until they yes. come into good... an arena that it feels like the stress just melts off them even if it's only temporary that's, that's what i do i yeah. provide a sanctuary for people to step away from the stress for moments at a that, time. That's beautiful. My tagline is inspiring tranquility. So nice. it's, it's, uh, that is, is, you know, what kind of all everything leads to that eventually, hopefully. Yeah, well, that's hopefully we all find it, right? Yes, it, yes. You're there to help people find that shortcut. Or yes, find well, thank you it. so much. Thank you. <laughs> so hopefully that helps. It does. Thank you very much. Certainly. You have a blessed evening. You also. I gotta get, get to yoga. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. All right. I wanted to open it up to um, anyone else who may have been hanging around for uh, for a little bit of practice or had questions about their specific um, elevator speech. Um, I wanted to say something to Daniel, and I, I would have put it in the chat, but 
I'm a terrible typist. So by the time I typed it all out, it would be like nine o'clock at night. <laughs> but I wanted to tell you that all of the things that you talked about when you talked about what you do and, and how you do it and why you do it, um, a lot of it was very technical and just went right over my head. But the things that stuck with me um, in particular were when you um, mentioned the part about the, the growing disparity in the, the digital divide between rural and, and urban, not just Washington, but America. Right. And I think, I think disparity and the difference in the struggles between urban and rural America have never been more, um, I don't know, kind of in the, in the public eye or just so center focused for a lot of us that I think that's something that is easy for everybody to relate to and understand. And then from there, then the question becomes, well, what are you going to do about like, what, what do you see yourself doing about it? Like I could see having a conversation with you just from that statement. And then you telling me what you do and how you do it and all that great stuff. It's good input. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I, I did want to say one thing too, in addition to what Susan's saying there, um, I think it's really easy for people to dismiss somebody if they don't understand what you're talking about and just, dis they don't wanna let on that they don't know, right? So it's easier for them to dismiss and seem disinterested in a topic that they don't want to admit that they don't know about. So if there was like that building on the disparity part, building on wanting to increase the prosperity in a region and having that story, um, I think that would be that would be pretty powerful and then get them asking and then, you know, see how much see how much they uh, they want to hear. But, you know, just tell them, hey, this is this is what I can do. You know, I can increase the prosperity, increase people's adaptation. Right. And yeah. you're playing on an emotional thing there. You're saying I love what you said, Susan. Thank you, because it, you're starting to play in that emotional pain of it's not fair. That's really what you're saying. It's not fair. And but now, well, like you said, to your point, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm gonna say, then like Susan said that Daniel now gets to say, that's what I do. I help close that gap. It, it, and to play off that, that's the intent for the website is to have these compelling, emotionally compelling videos, you know? So we're, <clears throat> one, of, one of the modules is what I call backup for America's heroes. So they're vets, cops, firefighters. And so we provide a, a, a way for those folks, especially the vets with PTSD, AT, ASD, um, anxiety, depression. So we've got dialectical behavior therapy. We've got psychoanalysts. We've got equine therapy. So we're working with the BLM and the USDA to bring in horses as well. So, what, so I, I've got folks that are writing the stories and helping make the videos so when you see this, my, my intent is you see this, you're going to want to just throw money at it because it's that awesome. Right. Good idea. Yeah. Those things just pull the heart right out of their chest. <laughs> Do you want to be a part of the solution or you want to ignore it? Good, yeah. job. Good job. I like it. Good job. Isn't it fun when people get together like this? James, you've really created a great platform where it's not threatening. We can have conversations. People can chime in and we see things differently than what we saw it an hour ago. Yeah, so. I, I love it. And, and, and to be honest, that I, I, I left the corporate world a few years ago when we moved out to Andre County, you know, and I had a, a global team of 420,000 people. And, and, and I missed the, the, the camaraderie and to be able to sit down and ideate with other folks and just to get feedback like we're doing now. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, even if it's like, hey, don't quit your day job, um, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, that so. genuine feedback we get. And this is really, truly the purpose of what James set up. This is a mastermind. Right. This is what a, a true mastermind does. Yeah. No, I think it's great. And I really appreciate you guys, uh, you know, with all the feedback and support you've been providing. This, this is awesome. And this is, this is what we need at least, I mean, I think everybody could use, but every, everybody is going to be able to benefit from this. Yeah, thank you. Well, definitely um, everybody 
stay tuned. We do these every month. Uh, we actually have uh, a, a great, if you wanted to check out some of the previous masterminds, we also have them on the Thurston EDC YouTube channel. So if you looked up uh, Thurston EDC and scale up, you will find those. It has the same logo from, uh, you know, this side, you know. Um, and, uh, and we've got a number of them that they talk uh, not just about like this, this elevator speech, which I, I thought that tonight's was one of the better ones that we've had. Um, we also have them come in uh, and talk about legal um, structure. We have them talking about how, you know, what you should look at for accounting. We had that, we had a uh, LaVon on uh, last, last month. Um, so there's a lot of really good content there and we will keep uh, bringing in experts to talk about topics that are relevant to you guys. Um, so be sure to stay tuned. Um, and uh, as always, uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, thank you so much, Joe Miller, for with the Pro Networking League um, to uh, for coming on and really sharing with us your knowledge. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you all who participated. And um, with that being said, I'm going to let you all go tonight. Okay, so, well, thank one, you. Thanks. One, one last thing for Joe. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. And just one second, Daniel. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. All right. Have a great night, you guys. Thanks. Hey, Thanks, hey Joe. Go ahead, Dan.